school needing a place to work, I started searching out other print studios. So uh, since I live in Los Angeles County, um, I've worked at Loyola Marymount University as a stu studio technician. I um, worked and printed at Angel Gate Cultural Center. And I was working at these shops and sort of experimenting with what I could do after school and with much, lim much more limited resources and equipment. Um, after sort of that exploration of different studios, um, my husband and I decided that we would like to start our own studio in Long Beach because there's a great printmaking community there, but there isn't a lot of studio space. Um, our first studio we began at the Art Exchange in Long Beach, which had a artist residency program and through which you could have storefront studios. So that's where the collective print studio began. Um, it has had several iterations since, garages, home, houses, we've had some warehouse space, and now we're back to a home studio. And one of the things that's been consistent through all these different places is that they're never perfect. There's never great water, you know, great like drainage or, you know, maybe your ventilation isn't adequate. So we really had to, I really had to change my practice from what I learned in university to something that's, I can sustain throughout, you know, different studios. So I was really flattered when they asked me to speak about this because this has been my goal since we started the studio was to create a safe and sustainable practice. Um, so when I when was given this talk, the idea of this talk, I thought through it and was like, what are the end goals like of my printmaking practice? Like, how can I imagine this of being really sustainable? And I was like, so what are the qualities of sustainability that I'm trying to achieve with my practice in our studio space? And so I, I sort of honed it down to five concepts. First is to eliminate exposure to harmful chemicals, or at least to limit, it, to limit them. I like to create no trash and only limited recyclable materials. I'd like to use minimal water and energy and to minimize the waste that goes down in the drain. I'd also like this practice to be able to move with me. So as like studios change, as rents go up and things aren't available anymore, I'd like to be able to take this practice and move it to different locations successfully. So I, using these five ideas, I thought about all of our different types of printmaking we practice. Um, screen printing probably being our most common, what, we're, what we do the most, just because it's the most useful, it's great for working and, um, you know, a, Project, different um, sorry, projects, but so that's a little background on the collective print studio and how it started. I guess uh, the little baby crying in here, that's one of my other reasons for emphasizing sustainability and safety because she's around and I want her to be able to print make too in the future. So starting in, let's start with screen printing and some options for a really sustainable practice. So for the first thing I'll talk about are the chemicals we use. Um, the emulsion we use in our studio is called Satichem Graphic HU. It's a water soluble um, non toxicological emulsion um, and we clean it using a Retag brand emulsion remover. These are safe to go down the drain into normal um, water, like city water sanitation programs. Um, and the thing I like about this product the most is that you can use solar exposure. So I do like to work in like a, a photographic silk screen. And so a technique we've been working on, and this actually comes, the idea came from, from the solar plate workshops that Dan Weldon holds. He uses this technique but it works great for solar exposure with screen printing. So we use a grained glass slab, which you can, instead of a film, so that's reusable, so you don't have this trash afterwards. And you can use, you can use different drawing media on the glass slab from, we really like these zig opaque pens work great, rapidograph ink, which can be used as, with a brush or can be filled into technical pens, which is a great, option because then you're not actually even throwing away a pen at the end. Um, you can draw on it with 
different types of pencil. Stabilo brand works great, but really it's really experimental. You can try different things and see what blocks the light. So you can create your image on a glass slab with opaque medium. And yeah, so I just have, so you can see the brands and kind of why we're doing it. Keep our babies safe. And then we like to use solar exposure. So the advantages of solar exposure are probably pretty obvious, but you say you're saving energy. You don't have to invest in equipment. So it makes the process really accessible. You can do it kind of anywhere, As, especially here in California with our sunny weather. It's a great location for it. So I broke it down into these this tile of images so you can kind of see the, how simple the setup is. Um, first, you just have a piece of foam and I like to get that out in my work area. This is just my doorstep, any outdoor table works. So you bring the foam to your outdoor location. Um, it'll be topped with felt. Your emulsed screen will sit comfortably on top of that and then it'll be topped with your glass. So usually I, I sort of broke it down so you could see how the stacking actually works, but um, usually I carry out the screen just co covered, draped with a piece of felt, and I just slide my glass slab underneath. So the middle image is after it's been covered, you remove the glass slab, you recover your screen, and then walk to your washout area. So you, this process, using this emulsion in an exposure unit takes about two minutes, but in the sun it only takes a minute, and you, you're left with a screen that works beautifully. Um, we don't require, don't, it doesn't require any hardener. It works really well for water-based and oil-based ink, so we use water-based in our studio. And it, yeah, you'll just get beautiful detail. And you actually, you, for the spray out, you don't need a pressure washer, so just a regular hose with a, a grip works well, so do, we just missed it. And you can get super precise detail. Um, I have some examples of what the prints look like in a moment. But the advantages of the sun are obvious, like that you don't you know, use the energy, but it just, what I like is that you can print make anywhere. You can take this and just a relatively small amount of equipment and materials, and you can take this process home. You can do it in a lot of very, transportable. So these are just some simple examples of screen prints that we've done using solar exposure and hand-drawn films. Just a couple of simple ones. But you can get really tiny detail. These are small, so this doesn't really show you, but you can get really tiny, fine detail with this emulsion. It's not chunky. Works great for text. Um, part of my job as a screen printer is to print book covers, and so I need to do really precise digital images and the emulsion works great for that, so. Right. And then, oh, I guess we'll talk about the inks. We, we do use um, only water-based ink in our studio because we don't want to involve plastisol in the fumes. So we, Jacquard and Speedball brand ink are great options. Um, I, they're really easy to find. Um, Pretty much every art supply store has them, and I one of the main advantage, other than like nice color and opacity, is that they don't seem to mildew as badly as other um, other inks do. So if you've ever worked with some of the larger, more shirt-based or more t-shirt oriented inks, you'll find that they mold, and if you're needing them to last a long time, sometimes that can be problematic. So those two water-based inks. Um, it is important that these inks can never. Any sort of uh, acrylic based material should never go down the drain. So it's really important that we are diligent and clean our screens well with scrapers and remove all the excess ink and just rinse away residue. So the other main practice our studio does is etching. So we currently use big ground etching, or the big stands for Baldwin and Talio ground, so the big etching ground. Um, it's an ink-based ground. It used to be labeled as non-toxic, and now it is no longer labeled that way. Um, I, it is an oil-based ink that you apply to your plate. Uh, I think with good ventilation, it's safe. Um, and the, 
all the auxiliary chemicals I think are what's really important because you do not need to use some of the products that you use with traditional etching that are the, sort of the most unsafe elements or some of the unsafe elements. So um, I'll go over what we use and why I think this is a great medium. So we do copper etching. Um, thank you. Big ground, like I said, is an oil-based ink that's applied to the plate as a ground and it's hardened. Um, you can use, it has all these great side techniques. So if you've ever worked with etching and done a sugar lift, that process can be replicated using instant coffee and really successfully. So you can paint instant coffee on your plate, coat your, coat your plate with the ground and then remove it with just water and you'll get a really crisp, clean lift. Um, you can use powdered sugar to create a aqua tint. So you coat a plate with the ground, sprinkle it with sugar and the sugar actually eats into the ground which you then cure and can etch with and it creates a really nice ground. Um, the stop out, this is like one of my favorite aspects is after you, you apply the ground with a brayer instead of a brush and when you're done you can scrape up all that extra ground that you can't really use again because it's been contaminated and you can mix it with lavender oil to create your stop out so sort of a recycling process and it works really well. Um, the Bon Ami and the Dawn on the left are how we degrease our plates. So we wash them really well with Dawn soap, uh, scrub them with Bon Ami, and then actually I rinse with the soy sauce to clean any residue of oil. That is a really important step in big ground. It does require a really thorough degreasing. Um, so we use that. Citrusol in the middle, which is an official container, but our studio one is a orange-based cleaner. Um, it's very strong and it does require gloves, but it, a very small amount can be used to remove the ground when you're done and it works really effectively. Yeah. So those are some of the auxiliary chemicals we use. And we also use the dish soap as a degreaser mixed with water. Um, so some etchings that we've done using these techniques are here. Um, the one on the left shows the aqua tint and line etching, as well as the sort of circular shapes are how it was stopped out. The one on the right was actually, we worked on that here as part of a workshop. So a lot of different, maybe some hands here contributed to that. But that was also an example of the stop out and um, the coffee lift there. Some examples of what you can do. We find that it's really versatile and in my experience it really mimics well the traditional like toxic techniques that were used, at least I learned in university, so it can get similar line quality and really beautiful aqua tint. So, all right. um, in addition to this, we are exploring the process of electric etching, um, which is done using basically the setup here. The only ingredient that's missing is salt. So using, some, using the power of batteries, um, we do wanna use reusable batteries for this eventually once we get everything using this more frequently. But using a big grounded plate, which is there in the center, you can use um, small alligator clips to attach a positive and negative line to your plate and a scrap plate, and you can etch quite successfully using electricity. The, the benefit, it's really simple, and this is actually like all the equipment you need. It's for around $20, you can have a full setup. The nice thing about this is when you're done with the water, um, you can let it, uh, you can pour the water into some foil, let it evaporate, and then your only residue is recyclable because it's just a little bit of copper, so it can be recycled along with your aluminum. So those are techniques we've been practicing in all the different studios where we've been working. And, sorry, so. and then I wanted to show you, this is all of that equipment for both those processes loaded into a milk crate. So one more of those to have ink and paper, and the studio is really portable. So if we need to do a residency, 
or need to move into the garage when our lease gets ended early, we can do it. So, um, and then some surrounding ideas for making your print practice safer and more sustainable. Um, some of the best smelling studios I've ever been into utilize plants. So like spider plants, peace lilies, just overloading your studio with those, you can definitely notice the air quality improving. Um, it's, yeah, it works really well. Um, you'll notice it in the air, and it's been, it's been proven that uh, different chemicals that we use from uh, xy xylene to, sort of forgetting the other one, those will actually be filtered out by those plants. So those are a great thing to use. Um, other aspects I started thinking about in our permitting practice was the waste, so like the physical waste of paper, plastic, and like how we can refine that. So um, we've been practicing diligently recycling our, or sorry, reusing paper, cardboard, making sure that everything's organized and accessible so that you can use the same scrap paper countless times to do your test prints. Um, little bits of cardboard are super useful for cleaning up ink. Uh, a big thing to avoid is plastic tape. That's sort of my goal for 2019. It's not recyclable. It's that like plastic that we're all learning about that, not just learning about, but that is um, not recyclable, that just ends up lasting forever and it can be avoided. So using paper tape when necessary, but trying to consolidate. So with the screen, a great use for emulsion that maybe is aged or maybe was exposed to light. You can use that to coat the sides of your screen to protect extra you know outside areas instead of tape um, yeah so those are some techniques you can use to refine both of those practices and make them a little more sustainable um, yeah so those are kind of how I go about those two and I, I showed you all my slides but so um, sorry. So that was most of the information that I wanted to present. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Um, first of all, we want to thank um, this whole amazing space for having us come. Um, it's an incredible honor, and we're extremely excited to be here and meet people and see this wonderful space and community of artists. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you guys for being here. It's, it's great to have such a nice, large audience. Um, so Mary and I are representing Remark Print Workshop. It used to be New Ground, so we've been trans transitioning the name. Uh, we bought it uh, um, almost three years ago from the founder and have been making some changes to it. Um, do you want to talk about this part? Um, this is our founder, Regina Held, and she started New Grounds um, 26 years ago in her garage in the South Valley, and eventually moved it to the Nob, Nob Hill area where it resides now. Um, and she um, started, so she says, the very first non-toxic print studio in the country. Um, and this is a New Grounds etching manual that she and one of the other artists uh, wrote, and we just gave a copy to um, your print studio here, so you're all welcome to look at it. Cool. All right. All right. Um, so we're just going to give you a tour of our space just for fun so you can see where we're coming from. Um, this is our main studio. Um, we have three Takach presses in the studio. Um, and here's one of our members. Our, our studio is, um, we have members, okay, so who pay a, a monthly membership and come and work in the studio space um, and have access to all the equipment, all the inks, um, all the tools that we have, all the brayers, all, this, uh, all the equipment that you need. Um, and we do work entirely non-toxic, so um, to this to this day since Regina founded it. Um, so here's some artists, you can see the studio. You wanna talk about the inks, Mary? 
Um, these are Akua inks. We have both, uh, we call the inks. Can you hear me now? Sorry. The inks in the bottles we call Akua color, and then the inks in the jars are Akua intaglio inks. And for those of you who don't know, um, it's a water-based ink that's with pigment suspended in a soy base. So the Akua color is the uh, same pigment that is in the Akua intaglio ink. It just has a different viscosity. Um, we use the Akua color mainly for monotype types because it's um, looser, but the into in Akua intaglio ink is designed to uh, wipe off easily with the tarlatans. Below it, we also have some oil-based inks, and um, people do use them. The difference being that we clean them up with um, without nasty solvents. We use uh, baby oil, mineral oil, um, rubbing alcohol in a little um, solution with water and clean them up. Some people like oil-based inks more than water-based inks. They claim that it acts a little differently, who are purists, and they think it has more pigment to the uh, medium that it's suspended in, so personal choice. But we try to um, mostly use um, uh, water-based. Yeah, most of our artists use the Akua inks. There's a few um, intaglio etchers who are old school. This is the um, etching, the room, the plate room. Um, we have uh, the, the vertical tanks, if you can see, um, and uh, airbrush station, and um, Mary's gonna explain the etching in a minute, so we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we have a classroom space, which we're gonna talk about too, because one of the things that we're really trying to do in our, uh, since we took over, is offer a huge variety of classes non-toxic classes to the community <clears throat> um, and uh, sort of create a really wonderful educational center. And we have a little break room. Oops, terrible photo. Um, we do have an exposure unit. Um, some, we do use the sun as well. There's lots of sun in New Mexico, um, but we are fortunate enough to have an exposure system which is really helpful in, um, in being precise about timing and so forth for some of the plates. Um, and we have a back proofing room. You can see that's the layout of the of the space. We're extremely lucky to have this huge space um, in a in a really cool area. So we're gonna really want you guys to come visit sometime. So six, six presses, come it. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is we have two gallery spaces too. Um, so we offer shows that we mostly every month. We have two different shows featuring uh, local printmakers, um, member printmakers, uh, invited printmakers. So. We'll talk about that too. We'd love to get you guys involved. Um, so here's our um, uh, main studio space. Gallery. Yeah, sorry, gallery space. And then a smaller gallery. Um, we call it the blue gallery anyway, um, for sort of intimate shows. And um, <clears throat> sometimes we have people curate shows. So this is um, a show um, of living New Mexican relief and other Southwestern places. Um, and a lot of times with our shows, we will um, we do a demo, so it's kind of a fun thing. Here's our intern demoing, um, and she's, you can see, using the Akua inks. And uh, another local printmaker, Henry Morales, um, who is, is in fact using the oil-based inks on his uh, woodblock print. If anyone has questions as we go to, please ask. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, so we wanted to show you some of our uh, the main classes and techniques that we show uh, that are non-toxic because I think that's what you guys are interested in, right? Um, so Mary is going to start off with uh, uh, some of our, our uh, copper etching process. Okay. Um, I used the plate on the left. I already had um, coated the plate, scratched into it, etched it, and... Uh, so what I am showing on the plate on the left is how we coat a plate. We stick it into a tub and we use uh, acrylic, okay, is this better? We use acrylic floor wax and we run it across 
um, let it drip off and then let it dry. In New Mexico, it's very dry, so it takes about, oh, maybe two to three hours to be completely hard. Um, the, in the middle, um, I, am, I have a hard ground uh, stump out on the dog and around it you see some uh, Sharpie, and Sharpie also can work as a stop out. And then uh, on the right, um, I am hanging, I, I degreased the plate and I hung it up and I'm going to spray some acrylic card ground as an aqua tint. So uh, that's, demoing the uh, spray. So you usually want to cover it about a 50% spray. And the spray, for those who, of you who don't know, you're spraying these little tiny droplets of the acrylic ground and then you put it in the acid. And the acid eats around what, is, what the spray is resisting and it will give you a um, aquatint um, chewing of the plate. Okay. We use um, acrylic hard ground and then the fabled Z emulsion and the man who um, invented the formula for Z emulsion unfortunately passed away and um, didn't pass on his recipe so it's a sort of coveted emulsion but people are trying to reproduce it all the time. It's like the mystery, right? People mystery, are trying to figure yeah. it out. So then uh, we dip it in our vertical tank and we use ver ferric chloride to etch it. And it's in a vertical um, tank because little bubbles form and you want them to rise up and not gather on the surface of the plate. You expose it for a certain amount of time. We have a chart here on the side that talks about different um, times to expose it. And the ferric chloride is the closest to non-toxic for this. <laughs> so I, I have etched it, and it has this kind of bright copper color you can see on the left, and you can see the stop out from the uh, Sharpie. And here I am just scrubbing it off, and you can see what a good resist that is. Okay? And uh, ink it up and etch it. And this was with the Akua inks as well, right? Yes. Yeah, cool. The non-toxic. Um, these are three prints I did using this technique. Does anyone have questions right now? No? OK. All right. Um, here's some other uh, intaglio techniques using the big hard ground. And um, we do not have what we have at our shop is just a regular hot plate. So as um, I'm sorry, as Alex. said, Alex, uh, you brayer on the big ground and then we uh, bake it until it turns uh, slightly matte and then scratch into it and it um, adds as a resist and etch it and then you use the soy salt to uh, get rid of the ground. Um, here are some other intaglio techniques that were used by our residency students. Uh, here's a soap ground, maybe made by uh, microwaving some uh, some ivory soap, in, and uh, you get this sort of frothy solution, and you paint it on, let it dry, and then apply a big ground around it, and then it washes off. So some different... Um, and here's some of the results of that. Results, yes. Anyway, lots of things to do. Um, we're just showing you some of the work that was done in the studio with these techniques. So this is one of our artists, Pam Wasolik. Um, these are her copper intaglio prints. Uh, we won't spend too long. And this is uh, all um, etching and shin kole. Do all of you know what shin kole is? Uh, shin kole is applying a... Um, largely Asian-based paper onto a printmaking uh, European paper using um, uh, like a powder paste 
and you use it with wet paper. So you get your intaglio plate inked up, you apply your shinkole paper with the paste, and then you drop, put your wet paper on top of it and run it through the press so it gets adhered and printed at the same time. So the, the color parts are the, are the, the shinkole, the little cut out pieces. Um, this is more of Pam's work. She's incredibly prolific, so we wanted to show you some of the cool stuff you can do with uh, all this non-toxic so etching. Each, uh -huh. each one of these little cubes is about an inch and a half by an inch and a half. Sorry. Each one of these little cubes is about an inch and a half by an inch and a half, and they're individually inked up, and she has maybe eight of them. She'll ink them up, put them on the press bed, run her put her damp paper on it, run it through the press. Then uh, she will re-ink them in a different color, put it on the press bed and add it. So this print on the left has probably gone through the press maybe six or seven times, more, more yeah. even. Yeah. Anyway, she's she has a lovely hand um, using the techniques and shinkole. She's the shinkole queen. <laughs> she also uses contact paper. Has anyone done that? So you can. Uh, stick contact paper onto <coughs> your plate and then peel off and Use the, the exacto knife. with an exacto knife. I believe this one might have she, yeah, anyway, uh, done that or this. Anyway, here's some more of her work um, done <coughs> with Shinkole. So um, another artist uh, who helped write uh, the book, the non-toxic etching manual, um, is Ray Maceman and um, he does these very whimsical pieces. Uh, the one on the left is one plate, and then the others are multi-plate uh, copper etchings. So, so I think this is a, a some kind of um, sh sorry. Uh, sh I don't. I forgot his technique he used. Um, Might have been a sugar lift for this area. Uh, so another technique now, there's wonderful uh, materials now for uh, photogravure and gravure techniques. Um, so we do a lot of that at the studio too. Um, we happen to have an exposure unit, but you can do this uh, with the sun and they're really low, uh, like they're not toxic. They say to wear gloves when you expose them, but the only thing you need, I mean, to um, develop them, but all you need to develop these plates after they're exposed is warm water. So there's no chemical uh, needed besides just warm water and you rub the plate. So here's uh, Lincoln, he's one of our owners and he's applying a transparency to a KM, KM plate, photopolymer plates, um, and you expose it and then you end up with a... Uh, um, then you need to expose it twice. Right, yeah, yeah. One then time. you harden it in the sun or in the exposure unit. But, uh, but the second... Oh. Exposure, excuse me, is a dot screen oh, yeah. on top of that, so you end up having these. Little yeah. um, so it, this is an example of it being used pretty strictly for photo. Uh, this is a wonderful technique, and you can, like I say, you can expose these in the sun as well. So it's something that is accessible. Um, and here's some of Lincoln's uh, work. He does. He makes them. They almost look like old, very, very old etchings or uh, photo plates. Um, but they're all done with this non-toxic and new techniques. Um, so these are the, the results of that. And you can also um, use these. You can almost create like a lithograph, a, a look of a lithograph without the stone. We don't have lithographic stones at our studio. Mary, do you want to explain these? Um, these are just drawn with a stabilo pencil on, on mylar, like a frosted mylar but you can get some really nice tonal values. Um, and the image in the middle is um, with sort of a sketch with uh, gravure and then etching is the color, two-plate two etching is the color component. Cool. Um, we also offer multi, uh, you could do this multi-plate, multi-color, uh, CMYK or other, um, other iterations of multicolor um, and four plates. Um, this is uh, one of our owner's plates um, and she's kind of combining images on Photoshop and then printing them for four colors. So somewhat like a four color screen print or um, uh, other four color printing process. Uh, there she is. 
so that's uh, we we wanted to represent her since she's not here. Cool. Um, oops, and then I mixed this up. Here's a couple more of uh, four plate, uh, four color, photogravure plates. So you can do a ton with these, um, and you can of course vary the color and so on. Okay. Um, did you want to do mocha hunger? Or is it? Um, you do it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, does anyone know mocha hunger techniques at all? No. Um, we wanted to show you a few techniques too that we do that don't require a press or are adaptable to a classroom. I imagine some of you are teachers or use this as well um, in some kind of workshops um, just to get you if you don't know these techniques. Um, Mogahanga is a Japanese technique and it doesn't require a press. It's all <coughs> based on um, stencils, uh, rubbing papers onto wood grain. Um, you know, sort of dabbing over the stencils. You can see here, um, there's, there, they have different colors that they're rolling out to get different textures. Um, and it's sort, of a, it's sort of a woodblock technique, but it's much more about the surface and stencils and layering um, with the wood grain. Do you want to add anything there? Well, and they're printed on both sides of the paper, usually a thinner, a thinner paper. Oh yeah, so it's usually like a, a thinner paper, a rice paper, or something like this. Um, but it's a really, it's a really beautiful technique. Again, all with Akua inks and nothing, nothing toxic. It's very fun. Uh, Mary, uh, this is um, a class I teach: innovative approaches to monotype. And I've discovered um, if you paint on UPO paper, which is a plastic man-made paper, Y U P O, with watercolor. Um, it doesn't beat up like you like it might if you were to paint it on a slick surface. You let the watercolor dry in its beautiful washes, and then you run it through the press with damp paper, and the damp paper reactivates the pigments in the watercolor, so you get these nice luscious um, washes of watercolor. And I like the way they look when they're cut up into shapes, sort of retro looking. You can also use um, the water soluble crayons to, in the And this is shapes. a really fun, it's a really accessible technique. It's really um, exciting because you can cut these all up and layer them and so forth. Yeah. So there's some examples. And I like to incorporate them with um, milk curtain dry point, which we'll cover a little later. I think it's a nice marriage of marks, of the dry point marks with the fluid um, painterly marks. Um, I, I happen to like using a lot of techniques that um, don't require expensive materials. As a, a teacher and an artist, I don't have very much money. So um, I love using Colograph and milk cartons and all this stuff. So you guys, some of you may know this. Um, so Colographs are made, uh, and it's super accessible because anything you can glue down to recycled mat board or anything um, to create textures. I know most of you probably know this. Um, but one thing that I learned uh, in Mexico that was really, really cool is that they, instead of waiting for um, and using some nasty uh, sealant, um, like some you know acrylic or stinky urethane sealant to seal your plates, um, you wrap them in tin foil and run them through the press and it's ready to go. It's almost like a, a metal plate. So you can see some there. Um, and, the, and the plates themselves are just so pretty. I love them. Uh, so it's a really immediate way to get a Colograph plate ready to go. And if the, if the um, tin foil rips or anything, you just take it off and put on a new one. So um, it's a really fun way. And you don't have to use all those smelly um, sealants. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever used carborundum, but that's a really fun way to make Colographs too. Um, it's just metal filings, and I just use um, matte medium or some glue, and then you, you know, kind of like uh, throw the uh, carborundum on there. You can get very painterly look with this. Um, and you can see here, here's a plate before uh, I put the tin foil over it, and there you can see it uh, covered. <coughs> and then, uh, you know, you can ink these as sort of relief or a combination of intaglio relief. Um, and it's amazing the detail that comes through the car, uh, through the uh, tin foil. So like all these little tiny details come through. Super, super fun. Um, and I do this with my students as well. Um, 
So that's some examples, and here's from the class. Um, so those of you who don't know Akua inks, I mean, I love color, and they have, there's just so much color. I think, I think they work really well. Um, and again, the cleanup is all just uh, rubbing alcohol or soap and water. That's it. So it's just fantastic. I used to, in Mexico, I used all the oil-based inks, and we cleaned up with kerosene. <laughs> And uh, that's, that's really toxic, so uh, I'm in love with these. Um, and there's some examples. Um, and here's some examples with my high school students. So I do, the, I do color graphs with high school students. They were trying to recreate uh, paintings. Uh, and so these are some of their little prints. Uh, this is the milk carton. So another really cheap and wonderful uh, thing that's accessible. You know, you could do it here. You could do it at, at, uh, anywhere that there's a, a press and some milk or orange juice cartons. Has anyone ever heard of doing this before? No? Oh, That's it's so, so much fun. Just a waxy coating on the board. Of course, you're sort of confined to the size of the <laughs> milk carton. But, um, and I actually haven't done this, but I'm sure you could coat a piece of mat board with wax if you wanted to and sort of calendar and do the same thing. But because it's so inexpensive, it didn't you can just throw it away and, and so you lot them. So um, the black parts on that print on the left the, uh, the are actually caused by peeling away the waxy coat of the milk carton or the orange juice carton and then that ink sticks there. So you kind of get a, uh, an etching but you also get like a little look of an aqua tin or something like that. Um, and, and Mary and I and, and a lot of artists sort of incorporate this into our work with other things with monotype, with um, uh, photo uh, etching and so forth. It's really, it's really fun and it's really cheap. So here's some examples. You get really neat lines. They don't hold up forever. Like you can't do a huge edition of these, um, but it's a really neat way to uh, explore line work. And here's some, I do it with my students. So these are little, they're like four by four, but, um, oh, sorry, they're a little uh, distorted, but um, it's a really great way to be able to do etching cheaply, uh, dry point etching cheaply, and, and get some really, really cool results as well. You can use nails, you can use exacto knives, you can use etching needles, whatever. Yeah. Um, another thing that we do a lot is trace monotype. Um, and so, um, does everyone know that or should we explain? I don't know. Um, we, you have a, um, you take your ink and you make it very viscous. Um, you know, roll it out at the slab, and then you take your paper um, with a print on it, and you turn it face down on the slab, and you draw on the back of it. And you, um, you get this nice, very characteristic mark, kind of rough and scrumbly. And then you also get sometimes noise, what we call noise, and that's just the weight of the paper on the slab of ink. But that can be nice too if you incorporate that. So this is an example of uh, some mono trace monotype and then printed uh, worked on top of. So it just can add another line element. Okay. Anyone have questions now or yeah, later? Okay. Um, so one thing that we've been trying to do, like we said, is have some um, classes inviting different teachers or different people who have different um, <coughs> techniques to come and teach a workshop. So if you guys have any techniques or ideas and you want to come to Albuquerque, we, we would be very excited to have you. Um, this is, um, I think I spelled his last name wrong, Pavel Acevedo, who has a print in the show, I believe, yeah. um, who uh, came to do a two-day workshop in conjunction with a show um, in relief and monotype. And he's a wonderful artist. You can see his work in here. A uh, wonderful person. And so this was a, a relief and monotype, and here's some of his work. Um, this print is big. This um, yeah. 09 print, it's probably three feet by four feet. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah he often works big. Um, another thing, um, we've, uh, again, this is really uh, amazing technique that you can do non-toxic is uh, cyanotype. And these were exposed in the sun outside. And uh, Adam Finkelstein, if anyone knows the Hand Magazine, does anyone know that? It's a printmaking magazine. It's wonderful. Um, check it out. He came and did a workshop. Um, 
Uh, this, is, this might be the most toxic <laughs> workshop we've done because this is a crazy technique where you combine traditional printmaking techniques with digital photo transfer and the method to transfer is Purell. So um, it, the whole place smelled like pur Purell. Um, but this is another uh, combining. So one of the things that we're interested in is combining techniques, messing with techniques, not just doing one technique. Um, a lot of artists do that, you'll see in a minute. So here's some, um, so you can see the photo transfer. This is from a, a print, an inkjet print onto a transparency, then transferred onto the paper and combined with collagraph plates and other plates. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting way to combine two very different techniques. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Ron Picasso out of Santa Fe. He's there with Dan Weldon and these other people. Um, really doing pioneering work in non-toxic printmaking. So check him out. Um, he did a, a week-long workshop um, and, and combining lots of different techniques. So it's kind of a theme of ours. Um, if you ever want to come, like I say, we've got lots of fun things for you to try or just write to us to ask us questions or anything like that. So every year um, so that we've been uh, um, owners of the new print shop, we inherited this um, once a year, we host something called a uh, um, call to entry, uh, international print. So people uh, submit their images. Sometimes they're the theme, there's a theme, sometimes not. And if you're chosen, and if you win that year's uh, show, you are given a one-person show and invited to come and teach a workshop. This is uh, Yoonjin Chow from from Korea, sorry, um, just Japan, uh, just the most lovely woman you ever met, and uh, she gave this um, lovely workshop, and this is a mezzotint on the left, but uh, she does that as well as intaglio. Yeah. Does anyone here do mezzotint? Do you know what mezzotint is? It's an intaglio process where you use a tool called a rocker. It's kind of shaped like an axe blade, comes to a point and little tiny ridges on it, and you literally rock it back and forth in many different directions on your copper plate, and the re result is sort of chew up the surface. Like, <laughs> sorry. It's like sandpaper. And then you take a burnisher and you smooth it down, and that's how you get the light areas. It's a crazy detailed and difficult technique. <laughs> um, this is uh, another winner. She's doing multi-plate uh, intaglio prints. Um, she's Korean. And this one's crazy. These are, if you want to look her up, if you're interested, these are insane. She does these multicolor ones, and then she does these um, these are huge, like four by three by four. I mean, the detail is it incredible. Is, yeah. And they're all like representations of her. <laughs> like all of those things are her somehow. Um, so uh, really, really, um, and she did a, a workshop in etching. And then just now we have this artist uh, from Israel and Venezuela. Uh, Lehi Tamor. Tamor, she is a combination of Okay, combination of photogravure and copper etching. And then she inks it up in a, both a cool black and a, and a warm black, and then works with sort of semi-transparent inks. If you've never ever used Van Dyke brown, it's a very, it's not a lot of pigment to the brown, so it gives a nice softness and it allows the uh, two different kinds of black ink to emerge. Anyway, very, um, cerebral sort of artist. She's going to be giving a workshop in September. <clears throat> um, this is Froll Bunden, uh, and he did a demo on, uh, this is another technique that exists, so we wanted to show you uh, zinc laser etched plates. So he creates these designs and then laser etches them. You can see them there on the left, and then overlays them and makes these uh, really multi-layered prints, which I didn't, I forgot to put in there, sorry. But um, another very interesting technique. Um, and this so. is Carl Whitaker, and he is uh, 
I think he's the one who was responsible for Pavel coming to us and giving the workshop. He goes around the Southwest and in Mexico and um, knows a lot of printmakers. He's a print collector, he's a curator. And here he is showing a carpeta called of different uh, Oaxacan printmakers, um, prints that he's put together. And um, he's just a real force to reckon with. And I he feel always like he's brings, been around here sometime or he will be. <laughs> he's a, and he brings mezcal. <laughs> That's why we like him. No. <laughs> it's good mezcal. Um, so one other thing that we wanted to mention to you guys as printmakers is this year we've started um, having uh, two residencies uh, for a week. So basically inviting uh, people to apply and then have, we had five artists come twice um, to uh, work for have a week in carp, the studio. Carp blunt for free. Yeah, you know, just for free. Come. Um, we feel like having a studio, uh, being fortunate enough to have this studio space, we really want to share it. Um, and and have people cross techniques so and learn our techniques, learn from each other. So we have people from all over the country and local come for a week. This was our first group. Um, and they all worked in different techniques. They all learned from each other, um, especially this group. Uh, they were really, uh, sh did a lot of sharing. Um, and this woman did huge, you can see huge, they were like 32 by how big, Mary? By 40, uh, dry point in Plexiglas. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dennis uses this crazy different techniques with drawings and cutouts and, and shin collé and monotype, kind of these really fanciful creatures. And then they each, each artist leaves us a print for our collection. Uh, oh. Second residency, uh, a very different group. We had people from all over again and got out the enormous roller, well, two enormous rollers, and took a field trip. So you guys have a Takach Press here, at least one, right? Over there, I think it says Takach Press. <laughs> so um, this is like the, has anyone heard of Takach Presses? Yeah, they're really great. So and we did a field trip. I have two two catalogs to give away if anybody is interested yeah. in Takach Press, but they're based in Albuquerque and they are they send their presses all over the world. And here they're making, um, I think these are drums for the roller. I'm not sure, but we get, we got a, a yeah. the owner. And here's some of the other work that um, people are doing. So one of the fun things about the residencies is just you know getting fresh energy, uh, meeting people. We really want to try to create like this community of non-toxic printmakers all across as far as we can. Um, that's one of our goals since we took over the space. Um, she's, this is a local woman. She's a, a teacher at the university, Luann Redeye, and she does these massive monotypes um, based on, she's obsessed with this this one person. So she keeps making these really amazing, um, she works from a drawing and then creates the monotype background and prints the uh, painted, the drawing part on top. Oh, I mean, okay, yeah, we're almost done now. Okay, uh, this is uh, Miles. copper etching, Miles Calvert. He's obsessed with Ottomans, so there you go. <laughs> Ottoman Empire, yeah. Uh, Von Trachman was doing gravier. So really different look. She uses her phone and really uh, blurry photos to create these images. And this was Laura Foster doing all kinds of um, etching and uh, intaglio techniques, all those crazy ones with the soap and the so on. All right, real quick, we're just going to show you two minutes of our work, and then we'll stop for questions. Um, I like to mix a lot of techniques. I'll go real fast. Um, this was a, a series on quipus and stones when I was inspired from Peru. 
So these have collagraph, photo etching, monotype, and stencil work, um, as do these. These are little tiny ones. Uh, these are from, made from photo plates of dumpsters. That's the basis for it. Um, so this is my typical, I'm not a clean printmaker, and I like to use lots of techniques. So you can sort of see uh, the photo plates on the bottom here, and then the uh, collagraph, and then monotype stencils, and so forth. This was from another series. So I do lots of layers and mixing of techniques, because um, it's more fun, for me at least. Uh, this is f so that the little marks are actually a photo plate, and the um, the seeds are um, a, a poop I found in the woods. Someone had eaten seeds, and I, I thought they were cool, so I'll go quick. And then this is just more monotype with trace monotype, and shin collé and monotype and trace monotype, and that's that. So, all right.